Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Facebook Live discussion. This is Maura Clancy at Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick, and I'm sitting here today with Carrie Baker, also from Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick. Our topic for today is a history of Agent Orange. It's a pretty broad one, so as always, we want to get right into the material that we've got planned. Um, as you probably know, if you've used our Facebook Live um, or viewed our videos before, we will be able to take some questions if you leave them in the comments. So if a question comes up that you'd like us to look at, um, we'll certainly do what we can to get to as many of them as we can. And we'll also use the comment section of the Facebook Live video to post any information that we think might be helpful to sort of supplement our discussion today and any of the questions that we can't get to. Um, so, Kerry, we're going to get started. Okay. Um, pretty broadly, can you tell us first, we're talking about Agent Orange. <clears throat> okay. What is Agent Orange and also related to that, um, what are the herbicides that we're going to be talking about in today's discussion for purposes of um, the exposure that we see so many times with veterans? Okay, so Agent Orange specifically uh, was a mixture of two different kinds of herbicides or 50-50 mixtures of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. And these were the normal butyl esters of each of those herbicides. Uh, so it was, and all that really means is it was a high, high volatile uh, herbicide uh, as opposed to a low volatility herbicide. Uh, so the vapors can damage plants a little bit more with higher volatility. So that's when you, when you talk about the butyl esters. Uh, that's kind of what that means. But so 50 50 equal parts of uh, in butyl ester of 2,4 D and 2,4,5 T. So that was Agent Orange. So each of them were herbicides on the market in their own right. Uh, and, and you can, and DOD and other agencies could get 2,4 D or 2,4,5 T individually. But Agent Orange per se was those two mixed together. And when we talk about Agent Orange, it sounds like it's one of several types of herbicides mm -hmm. that we know were used by the military, right. by DOD, et cetera. So what are the other types of herbicides other than Agent Orange? All right, so that's a really good question because VA doesn't, uh, VA's rules and regulations, as you know, and their statutes, and they don't use the, the, the term Agent Orange, uh, even though that's what everyone else uses. They use the term herbicide agent. Um, and so, and that's because there were, mul like you said, there was multiple other herbicides that were used in Vietnam, uh, and those were known as kind of the rainbow herbicides, and they were agent, uh, obviously agent orange, but also agent white, agent blue, agent pink, agent green, agent purple, um, and all of those were a mixture, of one form or another, of 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, the two in agent orange, or picloram uh, and cocodylic acid. So in breaking that down a little bit more, Agent Blue, for example, was one that was used quite often. That was cocodylic acid, uh, which is about 34% uh, arsenic. So uh, so also not probably very good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, picloram, uh, uh, Agent White, was uh, 2,4-D in picloram. Uh, and the mixture was also known as Tordon 101. Uh, on the open market, no difference in the two whatsoever. Even though some some people say there there were di uh, they were different, they were not. Um, and same thing with Agent Blue, uh, Fight R five sixty was the uh, was one of the uh, the common names for it. Uh, as far as the other ones, Agent uh, Pink, Green, and Purple, they were various combinations of. 2,4,5-T mostly, but also one of them also had some 2,4-D in it. Um, so when I say combinations of 2,4,5-T, uh, as there were different kinds of esters, you know, mm -hmm. some lower volatile, some higher volatile, and some of them was, were mixed together to form, uh, you know, uh, some of those other, but they weren't, there was, those were used earlier in the war. So we talk about Agent Orange because, from what I understand, it was the agent that was most used the most on a most widespread basis in Vietnam correct. throughout the Vietnam era. So yeah. most frequently and for the longest period of time. That's correct. Yeah. But herbicides, for the purposes of VA's regulation and the statute, 
are what we're talking about. So we're not just talking about Agent Orange, we're talking about the other herbicides that Kerry was just mentioning. Um, Agent Orange is just the term I think that's coined because of how frequent and for how long it was used. Correct. And why were all of these herbicides used during the Vietnam era? Two main purposes, and it was uh, uh, crop destruction, all right? They wanted, uh, the government wanted to destroy the, the crops of the enemy, so to interrupt their food supply, and also to destroy the foliage in the jungles. Um, that's where a lot of uh, ambushes were taking place, so you could open up fields of fire. So our, in, in essence, to provide a little extra safety to our troops so they wouldn't get ambushed quite so easily. So before the herbicides started to be used for these purposes, mm-hmm. um, do you know who was behind the development <clears throat> of these substances? Uh, that's a, a few different entities were mm-hmm. behind. I mean, herbicides, in talking about 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T mostly, had been around since World War II. Uh, and they were <coughs> near the, <coughs> excuse me, near the end of World War II, they had even looked at using herbicides in a tactical environment um, back, back as far back as, uh, you know, the late 40s. Mm-hmm. Um, but also they, they, they were interested in using them in the Korean War. They never did, uh, as far as we know, uh, but there was some interest in that. Um, so these were herbicides that were in use, <clears throat> but once the, they kind of started into the Vietnam era, uh, Fort Detrick and the Chemical Corps, Army's Chemical Corps, kind of uh, started testing various types of different combinations of herbicides to see what they thought would be the best for the jungles of Vietnam. Also, uh, ARPA at the time, or DARPA as most people know it now, uh, was heavily involved in uh, in that research as well. ARPA is the Advanced Research Projects a- Agency, now the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So it was a mix of DARPA, uh, the guys at Fort Detrick, um, you know, and just taking herbicides that, that were already on the market and figuring out what combinations uh, were the best to use. So it sounds like they were ramped up in terms of their development and in terms of getting the, together the substances that would be used in Vietnam, but this is something that pre-existed Vietnam, right. had sort of been in formation years prior to that. Right, and and just just so the, you know, the audience knows, if we could do you know, stories on top of stories mm-hmm. on the development. There's a lot more to it, and that's just the, kind of the 10,000 foot version, um, but there's no reason that we really need to, to go into that level of detail on it. So for, for however long these herbicides had existed prior to their use, mm-hmm. um, probably just previous to the Vietnam era when they started to make the specific herbicides that we now know to be Agent Orange and the other types of things that were mm-hmm. used, do you know of any testing of these substances that happened before their widespread use in Vietnam? Uh, yes, they had been testing these throughout the 50s in various places. Uh, they, well, they started testing them in the 40s. Uh, they were testing them in the 50s. And they were testing them uh, quite a bit in the early years of Vietnam, both in Vietnam. Uh, so sort of while they were using them, they were also testing them is one way to look at it. Uh, they were also testing them in, uh, for example, they tested them in Thailand in 1964. Um, it's pretty large areas. And I'm not talking about the Thailand perimeters. In 1964, there was an actual testing phase going on by ARPA at the time um, because the jungles there were so similar to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they wanted to you know, see how much it was killing the plants, how long it would take, which combinations were the best. But they were tested in some bases in this country. They were tested in New York. Uh, they were tested uh, at Fort Gordon. In the 60s, um, they were tested in Puerto Rico. Uh, they were tested in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, you know, the the history of the test is is, uh, and it, when I say test, I'm talking about the uh, the official test that 
uh, Fort Detrick guys were involved with that the military was officially testing them. It, these were not the only uses of these herbicides. So during these testing procedures that predated the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. um, there would have been people working on the testing that were exposed to these herbicides because oh. in order to perform that testing. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then by the time that these herbicides were being used on a more widespread basis in Vietnam, um, what was the method that they were used for? So in addition to the purpose that mm -hmm. you explained before, which was twofold, the right. crop destruction and then also to reduce foliage surrounding areas, mm -hmm. how were they deployed? Mainly with uh, about four or so different ways. The, most people know uh, of them being sprayed out of C-123 aircraft. Uh, these were rel relatively large aircraft that could spray uh, a pretty large swath in one pass. Mm -hmm. uh, they used quite a few C-123s for this. They also used uh, some uh, helicopters uh, for a little bit smaller areas to spray. Uh, they used what's called buffalo turbines, which are basically truck-mounted uh, sprayers, uh, they would, you know, those were good for uh, roadsides and uh, perimeters, and they also went all the way down to, uh, you know, handheld sprayers. And so, one of the main um, operations or outfits that we know was responsible for the deployment of herbicides is Operation Ranch Hand. Correct. Now, mm -hmm. which which category did that fall in? Was that mostly through aircraft? Right. So, Operation Ranch Hand was sort of the code name used for the C-123s spraying the herbicides. Uh, most of the other people that used the herbicides were uh, from the Army Chemical Corps. Okay. Uh, so, the, so, the, so the ground spraying, that type of stuff, was mostly the Army Chemical Corps. So with all these different methods of deployment of these substances, it seems like there's a lot of hands involved that could have possibly been exposed. So True. not just the people that are working um, you know, actually spraying by hand on mm -hmm. the ground, but also people working on the planes and the vehicles that yeah. are um, delivering, so to speak, the substances. Yeah. And in fact, some of the, you know, in the in the years after Vietnam, there was tons of back and forth uh, between veterans and Congress and the VA um, and trying to figure out how people were exposed, who were exposed. Uh, they never came to any solid conclusion, you know, as far as how much people were exposed. A lot of the records were missing, mm -hmm. uh, especially the records of the, uh, the ground spraying as opposed to the C-123 spraying. And, you know, a lot of experts had concluded that it was likely that, you know, spraying around perimeters of bases uh, probably exposed more people that way uh, than potentially even the spraying with the C-123s. That's an assumption, obviously. We don't know. Congress eventually gave the benefit of the doubt to everyone mm -hmm. uh, as far as exposure goes. So, you know, it's not something that, that's really an issue with Vietnam now. So it, it's fair to say that even if the persons who are claiming that they were exposed weren't on the C-123s and weren't actually conducting the ground spraying themselves, it's still very possible that others that weren't doing those things were mm -hmm. exposed and that's why we have the presumption of exposure right which is what congress enacted because it's just too impossible to tell who in mm -hmm. in terms of vietnam if you had boots on the ground there's no way for us to be able to verify that you weren't exposed so we have to extend that right. presumption right i mean there were millions of gallons sprayed so right congress expressly in their in the uh in the in the act of 91 uh, in the legislative history very clearly says we are giving veterans the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. uh, on their exposure because we just can't prove who was and who wasn't and you know most people certainly probably were to some degree or another. And at some point um, mm -hmm. the decision was made to stop using herbicides in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Um, do we know around what time that happened and what the reason was for that? There were a lot of uh, there were a few instances of sort of back and forth where the White House uh, and the commanders were were kind of hesitant to stop it, uh, and then they were going to stop it and not stop it, and then they were going to limit the use of it. And so that I'd say that the details of that history is probably not important, uh, but they did eventually stop using it uh, airily, uh, in other words, out of the C-123s in 1971. Um, 
and there is some indication they might have used uh, either uh, either by permission or not by permission to a smaller degree after 71, but generally the accepted time frame is uh, somewhere around 1971 is when they stopped using it. And at that time, so they made the decision to stop using the herbicides, but at that time there were still leftover substance substances um, right. that had not been used. So what happened to all of the you know so-called leftover mm. herbicides that the Army decided to stop using or that DOD in general decided to stop using? Well, they had, um, they had huge stockpiles left over in Vietnam. Uh, they also had uh, huge stockpiles at that time in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, those had been transferred there from a base in Texas. Uh, but so the the two you know the two places that most people know about were the were the ones left over in Vietnam, the ones left over in Gulfport, Mississippi. Eventually, they moved all of both of those stockpiles to Johnston Island uh, around seventy four. Uh, that 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 move was sort of complete around that time frame. And do we know what happened to them? Yes. Yeah, so they so they stayed on Johnson Island until seventy seven, and in 1977 they were all uh, loaded onto a ship and burned at sea. I believe the ship's name was the Vulcanus. Uh, you might not quote me on that, but I, I my memory serves me right. That's the name of the ship. But anyway, they were burned at sea. Uh, uh, you know, at least all of the Agent Orange was. Some of the Agent Blue uh, was not able to be burned at sea uh, because of the arsenic content in it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a very little known fact. But, mm -hmm. uh, but all the Agent Orange was burned at sea in 77. So we're clearly talking about, I think everybody knows this, we're talking about a substance that's very harmful um, mm -hmm. in a number of different ways, depending on how people are handling it and how mm -hmm. much um, exposure you have to it. So um, one of the things that makes up a lot of these herbicides, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a common um, element in all of them is dioxin. Well, it, not in all of them. Okay. Uh, uh, di the, uh, there's multiple dioxins on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, the most powerful one is TCDD. Mm -hmm. um, now that's short for 2378 TCDD. And I'll try to pronounce this word. All of that is short for tetrachlorodibenzoperidioxin. That's why we say TCDD, because it's just too hard to pronounce. <laughs> but uh, that was a contaminant in 245T. And so since most of these, except for picloram and uh, cocodylic acid, were different formulations of 245T, then most of these, you know, all your, your pink, your green, your your uh, purple, your orange, all had uh, contaminants of, two, uh, of TCDD in them, and that dioxin, you know, prior to '71, when when more emphasis started to be put on use of herbicides in Vietnam, it was discovered that that was a a, a, a heterogenic it had a, if I'm pronouncing it right, had a heterogenic effect. In other words, it it produced birth defects. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of raised the red flags, and that's why it was eventually stopped used, uh, s stopped being used in '71. And that's jumping forward a little bit. That's also why the government banned all of its use in 1985. Mm -hmm. um, most people get that a little confused. They, you know, the VA will come back on a lot of claims if you're not talking about Vietnam. Uh, and if you're talking about a window outside of the Vietnam era, say, you know, 76, 77, and uh, VA will say, well, they, you know, we stopped using it in 1971. That's not true. We stopped using Agent Orange in Vietnam in 1971. But 245T based herbicides were still used um, on various bases around the world, uh, both military and civilian. That wasn't stopped until '85, mm -hmm. and that's when all of it was banned. And there were some uh, prior bans, uh, such as on food crops, that type of thing, prior to '85. So around then, around 1985, um, actually, I think a year before, mm -hmm. in 1984, Congress passed something called the Veterans Dioxin and Radiation Exposure Compensation Standards Act. Right. Well, let me back up just a bit and mm -hmm. say that the, the stoppage in 1985 had nothing to do with the military. Mm -hmm. That was it, it, 
no one could use it after that point. Right. Uh, but you know, that's just a little history on 245D herbicides. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The, uh, the Congress finally acted in 1984. Uh, with that act that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and I'll let you ask any questions you want about that act. <laughs> so pretty predictably, um, <laughs> what is that act about? Um, can you give us maybe a couple things that precipitated the act and what the effect of it was at that time? Well, the um, basically what precipitated it is a really, really long history, but that's sort of the VA and veterans and Congress going back and forth as to you know, who was exposed, how much they were exposed, was it bad for them, was it causing people sickness. And that's kind of what precipitated the act in 1984. Mm -hmm. um, now the act in 1984 uh, had dealt with herbicides or dioxin and radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 1984 they were creating statutes to help radiation exposed veterans from World War II. Uh, so, uh, you know, something to put in perspective. Obviously, we're not here to talk about radiation. Um, that act with regard to herbicides essentially, uh, now it said it was the dioxin and radiation compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important. Uh, it didn't say Agent Orange, it didn't say herbicides in general. It's talking about herbicides containing dioxin. Um, so basically that act made or, or instructed VA to study the material, study the herbicide, and uh, create regulations as to who could get benefits, uh, what benefits they could get for what diseases, uh, and that type of thing. It wasn't the Agent Orange Act of 1991, mm -hmm. which a lot of people are familiar with, uh, but that was the very first time Congress acted uh, on Agent Orange. Okay. And shortly after, um, we had the occurrence of the Niemer mm -hmm. class action. Mm -hmm. um, how did the act that we were just talking about, the Dioxin and Radiation Exposure Compensation Standards Act, how did that sort of feed into what eventually happened okay. with Niemer, if at all? Good question. So, so a lot of people that have been in this business and, and affected by this know about Nemer. Mm -hmm. uh, Nemer was not brought on by the Agent Orange Act in '91. It was brought on by the one in '84, uh, and so that act kind of told VA the kind of standards to use when looking at, uh, you know, what disabilities this cause, what standard of proof do you want to use. Uh, and it was basically a statistically significant standard or a positive association. Um, and essentially that meant just as, no, just as much evidence for as against an association. Uh, and that's kind of putting it lightly. But what happened is when VA wrote its regulations, they wrote a cause and effect uh, criteria into their regulations. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, an organization called NVLSP at the time uh, brought lawsuits on behalf of three widows. One of them was uh, a lady named Beverly Niemer. And that's how you get the Niemer lawsuit. Uh, but that essentially challenged uh, VA's regulation because it and the challenge was that their the cause and effect standard was higher than the statute, higher than what Congress intended. Uh, there were other things that the, that the litigation attempted to do, but that's one uh, main area that it prevailed in. Mm -hmm. So the courts uh, out was courts out in California. There was no veterans court at the time, so the only place to take this was private courts, uh, or, or you know, courts non specialized, non -spe not a specialized right. veterans court. Right. right. So the courts looked at it and they agreed 100 percent that the standard they used was uh, was incorrect. It was too high of a standard. So what they did was essentially. Uh, they invalidated the regulation mm -hmm. uh, and and told VA to re-adjudicate any claims that have been denied under the then uh, uh, invalid regulation. So basically, even though the act had said um, not the cause and effect standard, but the sort of close to the at least as likely as not standard, mm -hmm. the positive association standard, um, for a while, VA was adjudicating claims based on their regulation, and right. the regulation required that higher standard. Now, right. this is all predating the presumption that we have today of exposure. We sort of talked about it before. The presumption is basically a removal of the nexus element. So mm -hmm. instead of 
having to prove any association between your current disability and your exposure, VA presumes if you were in Vietnam during certain dates and if you had boots on the ground in Vietnam, Correct. they're not going to require any proof. Right. But back in 1984, the act was requiring a, the positive association and the regulation got it wrong by requiring that cause and effect. Well, the, the, uh, the claims that were adjudicated back then, since there were no presumptions, still required the basic uh, in-service exposure, the current diagnosis, and the nexus between the two. Uh, the, so that act, the 84 Act, didn't necessarily reduce uh, the standards of uh, proof for service connection, but it set up the eventual um, research criteria, the VA's mechanism to determine what diseases would be added uh, as a presumptive. Mm -hmm. And the standards that would be used for those diseases. So obviously, if you're you're going to use a higher standard like a cause and effect, you're going to get very few diseases, if any, added to the presumption. Right. Uh, because short of experimenting on humans, you're not going to come out with a cause and effect. It's just a very high standard. That's why the benefit of the doubt standard was so important there, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what helped uh, NVLSP prevail in the Nehmer lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And so Nehmer helps um, not just the Vietnam veterans who were exposed, but also um, the class can include survivors or family members of veterans as well. Yeah, so not to get too much into Nehmer, but uh, if, you know, the, as far as who gets benefits under Nehmer, uh, first, it, it, it goes to class members, a NEMA class member. A NEMA class member is the veteran who served in Vietnam or the veteran's uh, surviving spouse, child, or parent. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of those class members can, can end up receiving benefits under the NEMA rules. But also a class member's spouse, child, or parent mm -hmm. can do the same. So when you're talking, and, and that's a little complicated, uh, it may not sound it, but it's, you know, and we don't need to get into all of that, but just know that a veteran's spouse, child, or parent, and the veteran are all class members. Mm -hmm. But the class member's spouse, child, or parent <clears throat> can also end up getting benefits. You know, and those are cases where the veteran's no longer alive. Uh, there were claims filed or, you know, at least claims for what Nehmer defines as a claim. Right. Uh, so... Not a whole lot of those going on now mm -hmm. because of the, the big Nehmer re-adjudication is over. Okay. And then after Nehmer, um, so we're sort of building up to that presumption that was eventually mm -hmm. established, um, there was the Agent Orange Act of 1991. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that and how that ties into this whole history? So that act, and a lot of the, the Nehmer final stipulation in the order that was signed by VA and the councils, uh, a lot of that came about very very almost at the same time as the Agent Orange Act of 91. Mm -hmm. um, so the Agent Orange Act of 91 established presumptions for certain disabilities but then also required VA to uh, contract with the Institute of Medicine every two years to uh, determine if there was research that existed out there between the herbicide agents and certain diseases that showed you know that hey, look there's a there's an association between this disease and the exposure so going forward every couple of years the IOM had to put out its report and they would classify various diseases in different categories um, and depending on which category if it was high enough up in the I guess you could say the statistical association between the disease and the herbicide then VA could add that disease to the list of presumptive diseases. And that's how we got diabetes and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a whole bunch of the, the disabilities on the presumptive list. So then it sounds like up until 1991, there were no presumptions at all for any particular conditions. Not, a, not a, you know, not, not under the Agent Orange Act of 91. Right. No. And then so after that, um, on an every two-year basis per the contract with the Institute of Medicine, mm -hmm. there were even more reveals going on about um, people just finding out new information or right. you know, bringing to light maybe old information about what can be caused by exposure. Essentially, right, the various entities, you name it, will, would be doing research on, on topics of 245T or other agents. 
and determine, you know, it, it, the longer time went, the more people they had to kind of uh, kind of do research mm-hmm. on. And, you know, some of these diseases take a while to, to kind of catch on to somebody. So uh, that's why you're, you're getting a little bit more added every, every few years. Uh, but now the tie to that and Nehmer, uh, mm-hmm. it was that the, under the Nehmer guidelines, VA was to re-adjudicate any claim uh, that had been denied for diseases that were added in the future. So, it, you know, so, so for example, heart disease was added in 2010. Um, there was a, over about 150,000 of those cases that required re-adjudication uh, when VA added uh, ischemic heart disease to the regulation. Uh, even though the, the heart disease was added under the Agent Orange Act in 91, and the Nehmer court battle started with the 84 Act. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, the Nehmer really drove uh, a lot of what we have now uh, with, with herbicides. So it sounds like a pretty big undertaking for VA when it comes to light that there is a condition that should be on the presumptive list and is added to the list. They have to now backtrack um, several years, decades mm-hmm. really, yeah. to figure out if there's evidence in a claims file or if they were on notice that a veteran had this particular condition. They need to re-adjudicate that claim and also mm-hmm. um, from what it sounds like they also need to see if there was the diagnosis and then even not the explicit claim, they need to adjudicate whether that person is entitled to service connection. Right. There's there's under the name of rules, there's multiple mm-hmm. ways uh, to, to prevail. Uh, obviously, the easiest ways is if you filed the claim prior to that disease being added to the regulation, mm-hmm. and it was denied, and then they add that disease later. Uh, but there are some other ways uh, to show that someone has a Nehmer claim. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't know that we need to, to get into all of that because it gets pretty deep into the mm-hmm. weeds. But, uh, you know, Nehmer's a little bit more relaxed on what a claim is mm-hmm. uh, than, you, than, your, than most VA regulations. Okay. And we sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, we've been talking about Vietnam quite a bit, but um, obviously herbicides were present and used in a lot of other locations. Mm-hmm. Um, Vietnam is the only location where if a veteran served there, there's this presumption, the boots on the ground presumption. Um, so, sort of. There's others? There's others. Okay. Right. Do you want to talk about um, a couple others? I'm thinking of the Thailand. Uh, as far as the presumption goes, as far yep. as the presumption of exposure, mm-hmm. you've got the Korean DMZ mm-hmm. in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I believe 68 to 71. I don't have the exact dates in front of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so if you were uh, in a unit that was on the DMZ uh, between that those those dates between 68 and 71 then you're presumed exposed okay um, now that I say, and that's a little tricky I say that if you were in a unit that was on the DMZ you sh- you just need to show that you were on the DMZ where the units come into play is is because it, it's written in the law that you know VA will check with DOD and determine what units were there certain units were known to basically work on and around or you know not in but on and around the dmz and it's not the unit that establishes the presumption of exposure it's because those units were known to be on the dmz right so it, it kind of makes it easier if you were in those units but if you were in some other unit say three miles away from the dmz or five miles away away from the dmz if you can credibly show that you went to the DMZ, the presumption is still supposed to apply at that point if VA concedes that, yes, we believe you were at the DMZ. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's service at the DMZ that drives the presumption, not necessarily service in one of the units. But that's the same type of presumption that's extended to Vietnam veterans. Right. As long as you, as long as you fit those qualifications. Uh, Thailand does not have a presumption mm-hmm. uh, per se. It's a case-by-case scenario. Um, as with just about any other location. Mm-hmm. And we did a f- Except. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of there's exceptions. There's always exceptions. Yep. <laughs> uh, and we also have the C-123s now. Um, the, not a whole lot of those cases. Uh, those were situations where the C-123s after the Vietnam War were was stationed back in the States uh, because they sprayed so much using those C-123s. 
if you were in one of those units and routinely worked on C-123s, you could be presumed exposed in that scenario. Okay. Well. And we did a video a few weeks back that talked about Agent Orange in Thailand specifically. Um, a lot of it um, deals with what Carrie was talking about, how it's not a presumption per se, and what the sort of factors that VA will look at on a case-by-case -case basis if a veteran served in Thailand and claims that they have a disability that's due to their exposure to herbicides there. So definitely feel free to take a look at that. Um, we'll probably post it in the comments um, here to this video as well. So that should also contain some information that's more specific to Thailand. Um, so in addition to the Vietnam presumption and the presumption that we just talked about that extends to mm -hmm. Korea, there's also a lot of veterans that may have been exposed that are not included in the presumption. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about first the difference between brown water and blue water veterans and how the presumption okay. works in that instance? Okay, so brown water veterans are basically veterans that served on a ship that went up the rivers in Vietnam. That That's considered in-country service. Mm -hmm. So, and I, you have to show that you were on the ship, but it, it, once you get over that hump, uh, that's, that's the same as being boots on the ground. Um, blue water veterans is a little bit different. You have instances where a ship may have docked uh, ashore or a ship may have anchored offshore uh, in a bay or a ship may have served uh, you know, miles off the coast. Uh, those are a little bit more tricky. If you if your ship docked ashore, you, you just need lay evidence, which can be a veteran's credible statement that they left the ship and went ashore because everyone did. I mean, you're not going to be out at sea for years and and dock to ashore and not leave the ship right. uh, unless you've been a brig or something. Uh, if you were anchored offshore and the ship sent people ashore, in other mm -hmm. words, the VA has records that the ship sent folks ashore, uh, the veteran can usually uh, state credibly that he or she was part of the people that went ashore. VA could potentially concede herbicide uh, or presume herbicide exposure there if they concede that you went ashore. And that's kind of the same thing with the ships farther off as well. Okay. Um, and while we're talking about the brown water, blue water distinction, and specifically about, about blue water vets, um, we have a question from Virgil. Virgil, thanks for the question. The question is, do you think that the 12 mile limit will be extended for blue water Navy veterans at some point? Okay, first, and I appreciate that question, Virgil. Uh, as of today, there is no 12 mile limit because the blue water legislation, if that's what you're referring to, has not been passed, uh, nor have the courts uh, implemented or done, issued any decisions that, that implement the, uh, the Blue Water uh, rules. The 12 mile um, limit, you know, is some discussion of if, they, if, if VA was to add blue, all Blue Water veterans to the presumption, mm -hmm. at what point, uh, you know, are you considered uh, presumed exposed or at what point not? And, you know, so the 12 mile, uh, 12 miles off coast has been discussed uh, as as that may be where the waters of Vietnam ended. We don't know yet. I mean, right now we have to get the blue water guys uh, presumed before the 12 mile uh, limit will even be an issue. Okay. And so while we're talking about that, um, that was good timing for that question, I think, because I was just about to ask what the status of the Blue Water legislation was at this time. I know we've given some updates as we go, um, mm -hmm. sometimes in our Facebook Live discussions that we have. Um, do we have any current updates as of today? Anything different? Uh, what we know is, and I believe it's HR 299 is the bill, but uh, I could be wrong there. Uh, but it, the bill... Uh, it's already passed the House, went to the Senate. The Senate's had a hearing on the bill, and that's where we stand at the moment. We don't know for sure whether the Senate's going to pass it. Uh, if they do, uh, you know, for those that aren't familiar with the legislative process, the, the same version that was passed in the House has to be passed in the Senate. So if the Senate does end up passing one, let's say it's different, then it has to go back to the House, mm. and they have to pass the same one. Um, 
so you know uh, during the hearing we know that VA was kind of pushing back against it as we all suspected they would um, but whether they've convinced the Senate to stop their action or not we don't know uh, I'm sure someone does but we mm-hmm. don't so it sounds like we're still in the midst of it still waiting for um, the next step to happen right. um, so we'll certainly keep everybody updated on that because we know that a lot of people are interested in the course of, mm-hmm. of that legislation and certainly our office so um, we'll be keeping an eye out for that um, I want to conclude by talking about um, something related to Agent Orange that we may have been seeing more recently. Um, so from what I understand, and maybe you can explain this a little bit better, but studies have revealed that TCDD, which we talked about earlier, which is an active ingredient in Agent Orange, has also been found in air samples from emissions at burn pits. That's correct. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe what that means in terms of will we ever see a similar presumption that's been created for the Vietnam veterans, for burn pit veterans? Is the evidence just not there yet? What are your thoughts? If it's left up to VA, I can probably safely say we will not see those presumptions. Um, but, it, you know, the, the presumption of service connections, say for lung cancer, as an example, one of the diseases listed in um, for Vietnam vets. You know that presumption is invoked when a veteran is exposed to a herbicide agent. Mm-hmm. One of the herbicide agents, as defined in the regulation, is TCDD because it says 245T, which is the herbicide, and its contaminant TCDD. So TCDD here, if you're looking at just that herbicide, that's the culprit. That's the contaminant. That's the dioxin. The exact same dioxin, uh, as well as a bunch of others and a bunch of other uh, toxins, were produced by the burn pits. Now, DOD and VA will, I'm sure, at some point when this comes to kind of a boiling point, will claim that it wasn't enough. Uh, you know, that's neither here nor there. What I, what I want people to understand is the presumption is invoked for service connection when you were exposed to the agent and then have the disease. Now, even though that may not be the way VA likes to treat it, mm-hmm. a plain reading of the law is that's how it should be applied, at least that's our opinion. So if a Iraq or Afghanistan veteran was exposed to the same stuff and VA concedes they were exposed to the same stuff, they should, for all practical purposes, provide the presumption of service connection for the same disease that would be given to, say, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, we are uh, we are pushing that issue and have been for quite some time. Uh, VA is, you know, standoffish about it. In fact, I don't know that they've even issued any statements whatsoever officially about it. Um, but it's something for Iraq and Afghanistan, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just one tool that we're trying to use to push VA and even Congress, if it if it comes to it, uh, into looking at what can be done about victims of burn pit exposure. Right now, VA is you know claiming that no, uh, it does you know there's no proof that A caused B. Um, I suspect there will be. Mm-hmm. It's probably going to take a length of time, unfortunately, like it took for Vietnam veterans or World War II veterans. We're trying to use the law on the books right now, based on the exposures we know about right now, to help the guys out. And that's just one extra tool in our quiver that we're trying to put to use. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like something else that we're definitely actively looking into and mm-hmm. keeping tabs on, and we'll certainly provide any updates in the future. Um, were there any other questions? So if that's um, if that's it for the questions, Carrie, thank you so much for teaching us about the history of Agent Orange today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And as I said, there might be some more information beyond this discussion that will be posted in the comments here. So definitely feel free to check it out and reach out with any other questions. And thanks again for joining us.